They all started as ordinary people. I just, that, that is so true. I, I have not changed. I am not anything other than an ordinary person. I've got my family here. You can ask them. I'm as ordinary as they come. And uh, you should not be impressed by any title that I have. Um, you should not be impressed by anything. The only thing you should be impressed by is God. And whether what I say has anything to do with what God has said. If I'm saying what he's saying, then you are, should be impressed with him. Let's pray. You are all together lovely. You are all together worthy. You are all together wonderful. And that is more true than any of us in this room really understand. But we are here to get a deeper glimpse. We want to see more. We want to be more enthralled with Jesus than we are now. And we want to trust Jesus more than we trust him now. And my prayer is that you would come and you would use what I have to say to help these friends build the house of their faith on the rock of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a great privilege to be here. It is a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be asked to speak here. There's a very real sense in which I do not feel worthy to tie the shoes of many of you who are pouring out your lives for the sake of the gospel and faithfully sharing the gospel to those who don't believe and doing the work of an evangelist. I, I consider you all the fellowship of the beautiful feet. You know, Isaiah 52, verse 7, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And like every believer, I'm called to evangelize. I don't have a, a whatever, whatever the gift of evangelism is, I don't think I have it, at least not yet, but I'm asking God for it. I'm not an extraordinary evangelist. I muddle through evangelism like most people, like ordinary people. And so when Matt Brown asked me to come here and speak, I asked him, why? Why do you want me to speak? I, I need to be here to listen to you. We're down here to rub shoulders with you. I need to learn from you. I'm here to sit at the feet of more effective evangelists than I am because I want to be stirred up to love and good works. But Matt, having gotten to know me some, we both live in frigid Minneapolis. I don't know why. Um, But he'd gotten to know me, and he read a book I wrote called Not By Sight, And um, he asked me to come here to encourage you in your faith, to try to do in 30 minutes what I seek to do in that book. Because if there's one thing that God has nailed in me, pounded into me, disciplined into me more and more over the past I was counting the time, 30 years, I'm getting old, I'm old, I can probably, I'm probably the age of uh, some of your fathers, so I'm not cool, <laughs> I know that, but the one thing that God has pounded into me is trust God's promises, not your perceptions, trust God's promises and not your perceptions. And you know, that's, that's nothing new. It's just a fresh way of saying, walk by faith, not by sight. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are what? Eternal. Faith. Faith is the conviction of what? Things not seen. So if you're going to live by faith, you've got to trust things that you don't see. You've got to You've got to trust promises and not your perceptions. And so if you pay careful attention to the Bible, you're going to see this truth everywhere. God, trust what God says, not what you see. Trust God's word, not the world. Trust God's promises and not your perceptions. What it means to be a Christian is to live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself up for you. And as evangelists, you are calling people to live by faith in the Son of God who loved them and gave, themselves, gave himself up for them. And so the question is, what, what does the life of faith look like? That's a really important thing to understand because it's what you're called to do. And it's what you're calling people to do. And the Bible is full of examples of what it looks like. Hebrews 11 is, is full of examples. Hebrews 12 calls them the cloud of witnesses. And these people, these biblical characters, were not superheroes. They're not characters in a graphic novel. They were flesh and blood people just like you are. They were ordinary people in many ways. They they were not superheroes. And they struggled to believe that God's word is stronger than storms and famines and armies and traitors and infertility and disability and bewildering delays to the things that you're planning and hoping for and shortages of money God is stronger than our weaknesses and our failures and our temptations and sins. These biblical saints that we look to in, and, and are the cloud of witnesses around us were just like us. But you know what they did? They believed God. They believed God. And that's really all I'm here to say to you. I'm, this, what I'm going to share with you is not so much a sermon as it is fatherly counsel to you. Because I want you to believe God. All things are possible for the one who believes, Mark 9, 23. And if you notice, everything that Jesus put the disciples through and just about everything that you're going to experience in this life as you follow Jesus by faith is going to um, be designed to teach you to trust him. Because the most important work that you will ever do, the the primary work that you're called to, that's, that's beneath your call to be an evangelist, is what Jesus called the work of God, believing Him. John 6, 29. This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. So you need to believe in Him. You need to believe in Him more than your giftings. You need to believe in Him more than your degrees, and you need to believe in Him more than your lack of degrees. You need to believe in him more than your influential networks or your wealthy connections. You need to believe in him more than your past sins. And you need to believe in him more than the effects of the abuse you've suffered. And you need to believe in him more than the intense and threatening pressure to compromise biblical truth to accommodate sinful cultural values, you're going to feel pressed upon. Your generation is going to be pressed upon to compromise biblical values in ways that that previous generations haven't been. And you need to know how to believe God, how to trust in Him, and not those pressures. And none of us have this belief thing down. We all have powerful places of unbelief at work in us. And we're aware of some of them, and some of those things we're, we're not aware of. 
And we need to have them exposed because they're going to undermine us if we, if we don't see them. And they're going to undermine our evangelism. And so for the good of our souls and the souls of those that God calls us to serve, God is going to expose the massive difference between the beliefs that we hold with our intellect and the beliefs that govern our actions and our motives. They can be very different. The difference between what we say with our words and what we show that we believe by our deeds. And the difference between believing God exists, like the demons do, (laughs) the demons believe that God exists and trembles, And believing that he is the rewarder of those who seek him, which the demons don't believe. And so, the question is, what does belief look like? And that's what I want to try to lay out for you today. The kind of belief that we're talking about, the belief that Jesus means when he says, believe in God, believe also in me, John 14, 1 is the belief that is produced by love. It's what Jesus meant when he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Obedience is the external evidence of what we believe. Paul calls it the obedience of faith in Romans 1. And the unmistakable mark of a true Christian is a supreme love for Jesus. And the unmistakable mark that a person supremely loves Jesus is that he or she believes in him enough to do what he says. That's the evidence. You know what love is. Love is how we feel about the people and things that we treasure. That's what love is. It's it's what you feel about what you treasure. And obedience is the way we serve the treasure that we love. So Jesus says you can't serve two masters, right? You cannot serve God and money. You will either love the one and hate the other, or you will cling to one, or you will despise the other. You will You will always obey the master that you love. We can't help it. It's the way we are wired. And you know what? The more costly the obedience, the more it costs us to obey, the more it reveals love. And that's why to be a Christian often involves costly obedience. Because it reveals, that that obedience reveals love for Jesus. And um, Jesus gave a great illustration of the kind of belief that love produces. It's one of the shortest parables in the Bible. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. And for joy, he goes and he sells all that he has to buy it. Matthew 13, 44. So let's take a look. What's going on here? Well, the man found the treasure... And he was captivated by its beauty and by its worth. And the treasure demanded that the man sell everything in order to have it. And so the man obeyed the demand. And you know what? It cost him everything. But but that wasn't that that wasn't some noble, heroic thing that he did when he went and sold everything that he had. He, He did it for joy. He did it because he couldn't help it. He did it because what he was going to sell wasn't worthy to be compared with what he was going to get. That's why he sold everything. That's what costly obedience really is. If we believe that Jesus is the treasure. Now, I want you to compare that man in the parable with the rich man in Mark 10... Remember him? He, he comes to Jesus and he says, Master, what, what must I do to receive eternal life? 
And Jesus responds, well, you, you know the commandments. And then Jesus lifts a few. And the man says, well, I've, I've kept all those from my youth. And so Jesus says, one thing you lack. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. And you know what? He could not do it. Why? What's going on here with this man? Well, he had obeyed a bunch of commandments. They were mainly, though, superficial. They were external. And he knew it wasn't enough. He knew something wasn't right. That's why he came to Jesus. What, what more do I need to do here? And so with one simple but very costly commandment, Jesus revealed the man's heart. He treasured, which means then he believed in money more than God. And all it took was being forced to choose between the two. And so he served or obeyed money's demands because he believed that money was going to make him happier than, what, than Jesus and what Jesus offered. The true treasure <laughs> demanded that the man sell everything in order to have it. And the man looked at that treasure and he couldn't do it because he didn't believe that that treasure was going to make him happy. That was going to be reward. He didn't believe that God was the rewarder of those who seek him. And so when push comes to shove, we will always obey. What we really believe makes us happy. And that's what I, I, one of the things I want you to understand. We will always obey what we really believe will make us happy. And what we obey reveals who or what our God is. And that's why belief is so important to God. And why it's important to the devil. <laughs> because everything hangs on what we believe. It's, and it's not the things that we say we believe with our lips, but the beliefs that come out of our loves. And those are the beliefs that actually govern our actions. And so that's when things get really hard, okay? And this is where I want to share my main burden for you. It gets hard and it gets strange because all of us have indwelling sin. And that indwelling sin infects every belief and every idea and every motive and every action that we have. We have this liar that lives on the inside of us. And then we are surrounded by other liars. And then there's the prince of the power of the air who is the father of lies, who fills the very atmosphere that we breathe with lies. Telling you that the treasure is not the treasure. Something else is. And so... If, we're like, if we are like the man who found the treasure in the field, the place that we are living right now is that time when he's selling everything to have it. The not yet time that we live in. And it's costing us everything. And as evangelists, you're calling people to sell everything just like you to have the treasure. You're pointing people to the treasure. And meanwhile, the lies within and the lies without are constantly arguing with you and they're contradicting you. And you know what? The parable, that parable doesn't tell us how hard it is to combat the lies that the treasure isn't real and it's not going to give you the joy that it promises. And that's where the line of battle is drawn, brothers and sisters. It's always been drawn there. Adam and Eve fell in the garden over a, a belief, a lie about what they should believe. And my burden for you, especially those who are younger, which is most of you, those of you who are in your 20s and early 30s, you're eager you're enthusiastic, you want to do something great for your generation, for God, and bring the gospel to your generation, and you're wonderful. I want you to do it. Sell everything that you have for the treasure and go for it. But I am getting close to 50. And I need to tell you 
that I've seen a lot of people start off eager and enthusiastic and I've watched them crash and burn. And I don't want that to happen to you. When I was in my 20s, I didn't know myself. I thought I did, but I did not know how weak I was. I didn't really know my limitations, not really. I didn't appreciate the depth of my, and pervasiveness of my own sin and how susceptible I, I was to being deceived. I, I didn't really know how much I trusted my perceptions more than the promises of God. And so I'm going to share a personal story with you, briefly. I can only give you the brief version. When I was 31, I experienced a crisis of faith. I was leading the, a, a very little ministry called Desiring God back then. It was in its early days. Desiring God. That was the, and for reasons I just, I just don't have time to, to explain, I suddenly found myself in a spiritual storm more intense than anything I had ever experienced. And I found myself doubting everything, including whether this God I said I desired even existed. And whether I was the treasure I was selling everything to buy was nothing more than fool's gold. And like the cloud of biblical witnesses who experienced their own storms, God so mercifully rescued me after an extended season. And this storm proved to be the loving discipline of my Heavenly Father to force me in ways that I had never had to before, to trust God's promises and not my perception, to walk by faith, not by sight, to trust in the Lord with all my heart and not lean on my own understanding. And what I learned in those days is still helping me. It's still helping me. It's helping me to hold tightly to God's word when so many things look wrong. When relationships break and tragedy strikes, and circumstances move me in directions I don't understand. When all around my soul gives way, the rock of Jesus' words are my hope and stay. And some of you are in a storm like that right now, or you're going to go into one. And what I want for you is for Jesus' words to be your rock. I want you to trust them more than anything else because nothing else is going to hold. Nothing else is going to last. Jesus says in Luke 6 that everyone who hears his words and does them builds his house on a rock foundation. Build your house on that rock because the floods are going to come. And if the house is not on the rock but on the unsound ground of your own perception, it's going to get swept away. And your flesh and the world and the devil are all conspiring against you, telling you, build your house on the ground because that's where the rock is. Don't build your house on the rock of God's word because that's sand. That's what they're going to tell you. Don't believe them. Let me bring things to a close here by telling you why it's so important that you trust God's promises and not your perceptions. And I hope this is helpful for you because it's been helpful for me. The Bible <clears throat> tells us that we are part of a great epic. This is really the greatest story that has ever been conceived, ever. This is the story of the glory of God, and it is being told on such a grand scale that the entire material universe, from the most massive galaxy to the tiniest molecular particle, are playing a role in it. And not only that, but, but all the unseen worlds, things that you and I don't get to see because they exist in dimensions that we don't even know about, they're all playing a part in this story. There's dimensions to God's story you don't even know about. 
This is the most real story that there is. And what I mean by that is, you know, like when you read a novel, you get, there can be comedies, there can be tragedies, there can, there's wars. And those are f- make-believe. Those aren't real. Even the best fiction, they're not real. This is all real. The comedies are real. The tragedies are real. And the cosmic war is as real as it gets. These things are not make-believe, and we are swept up. You and me are swept up into it. And because there's so much going on in the story, at any given time, we are only perceiving a tiny, tiny fraction of it. So is it any surprising that, that things so often don't look right? They look wrong from our perspective. Just, just, just think about the Lord of the Rings, right? I hope you've read that or at least seen the movie. For most of the story, to the char- from the character's perspective, things look wrong. They look ominous. They look hopeless. They don't look, they don't look right. They don't look good. They don't look hopeful. They, don't, they could not see from the author's perspective. They were experiencing the story as things unfolded. And it's the same thing for us. We, we cannot take hope or hopelessness from the things that we see and how they look to us, and how they make us feel. Our pain, it may be very real, just like Martha and Mary's pain were very real outside of Lazarus' tomb, and the author of that story wept with them, even though he was going about to raise Lazarus. They didn't know all the bigger things that were going on in the story. They just knew they lost their brother. And just like them, we can often jump to the wrong conclusions because we don't know what's going on. We've got to take hope from the author's perspective. This is where you've got to build the house of your faith, on this. Because all the things that the author has deemed sufficient for our life and godliness are there. He has mercifully given them to us in his word. And so we can build our house on that rock because it is what is real. And so, in your roles, in the epic of God, I mean, some of you are going to be betrayed by those close to you. And like Joseph in the Old Testament, you're going to find yourself in a place that you don't want to be, and you're wondering why God is allowing it, and you're going to need to remember God whose sovereign power is so mighty that Joseph was later able to say to his brother betrayers, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive. Some of you are going to maybe be like Jonathan, Saul's son, who was the heir apparent to the throne of Israel, who who humbly was asked to step out of a role that was rightly, from a hereditary standpoint, his, to be the king, to make room for someone else that God was going to raise up. And some of you are going to be called to do that, humbly yield power. And you'll need to remember Jonathan. And some of you, You're going to find yourself like Nehemiah, faithfully doing what God has called you to do, and suddenly you are hit with a barrage of fierce opposition and bewildering delays. And your call is going to be like Nehemiah to believe that God is doing a thousand glorious things in everything that appears frustrating and bewildering and delaying to you. And some of you right now, right now, feel like Moses in Exodus chapter 3, and you don't feel qualified for your calling. You don't feel qualified for much of anything. And your call is to believe that when God says, I will be with you, Exodus 3.12, that is qualification enough for you to obey. And some of you will or may now feel like Naomi in Ruth chapter 1. Remember Naomi? Lost everything, husband, sons. She was destitute in Moab. She went back to her home in Bethlehem with nothing. It's going to look like tragedies strike and God is against you. And he's not against you. He's just doing something that you don't understand and your call is going to be to believe that the God who did not spare his own son but gave him up for you to save you 
is doing more than you can possibly imagine in tragedies that don't make sense to you right now. And what more can I say? There's so much more to say. For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms and enforced justice and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions and quenched the power of fire and escaped the edge of the sword and were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, which all these things are wonderful, but some were tortured refusing to accept release to, so they, they might rise again to a better life. And others suffered mocking and flogging and chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. And those things didn't necessarily look right. They wandered about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. Did that look right? And you know who they were? They were people of whom the world was not worthy And just like them, at any given point, things may not look, make sense to you at all, and it's exactly what God is doing. And this cloud of witnesses that are here, they're there to tell you, you are playing a role in a greater epic than you know. And their message to us is, believe God. Believe his sufficient, inerrant, reliable word. Believe him, trust him, bank on him. Listen to him. Love him so much that you can't help but keep his commandments. Sell everything and buy the treasure. Walk by faith, not by sight. Look to the things that are unseen, not to the things that are seen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Build your house of faith on the rock of Christ's words. Trust God's promises, not your perceptions. Let's pray. Oh God, there isn't anything harder when, things in, when emotions inside of us and perceptions that we have and things, external circumstances, they're all conspiring to tell us something, it can be so compelling. And I pray that you will give your people faith. Help them to believe you. Teach them to trust you. Give them grace to build the house of their faith on the rock of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.